anyone need Dave's number, you can get off Paul later. Anybody's got some outstanding uh, deposits they need back? He's related to me too, isn't he? So I should be able to uh, use him up sometime. Anyway, got connections apparently. All good. <laughs> All right, we'll have a look at our, our Bibles today. And uh, yesterday was good, our sausage sizzle down the, down the road. Uh, the, those folk Pastor Tim was talking about, I'd finished cooking all the sausages and everybody had had one, two, or maybe three sausages each. And um, there were four left. And I thought I was just going to go up and sort of hand them around, see if I could get rid of the last four. And then these four people turned up that, we, that, that were hopefully going to the meeting today in Brisbane. And they grabbed the last four sausages, so that was they were they were saved, put aside, waiting for them to turn up. So that's what I reckon. So anyway, all good. And um, all right, we're going to have a look at the uh, our Bibles today. We'll go to John, and no, we won't. Yes, we will. John chapter three. But um, uh, the the title on the talk is uh, just a, a life worth living, and. Um, you know, and, and you know, we heard in testimony there, Sister Sharon. She she thought her life wasn't worth living. She she wasn't happy with her life, and uh, sadly, uh, that is the case for a lot of people in the world, and probably millions and billions of people are just really not happy with their lot in life, and perhaps not happy with their life at all, and uh, they probably don't think their life is worth living. Um, Oscar Wilde, uh, the famous fellow that does lots of quotes. He actually said, to live is the rarest thing in the world, most exist, and that's all. And uh, I, I think that's pretty accurate. You know, a lot of people just get by in life and they exist. They're living, but they're existing and living. Are they really living the life that they, they want and uh, they would like to choose to live? You know, and um, Jesus said, well, actually, I said John 3, John 10. Where's my glasses? I can't read anything. Here we go. John 10 verse 10 just one verse here it says the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly so Jesus words here says I've come to give you life I've come to give you a life that's worth living and he said not just one that's worth living but one that's abundant one that's just over the top abundantly worth living and um this is Jesus' words here, not mine. And, uh, you know, and, and that's the one, you know. We, there's so many people just existing, but Jesus offers an abundant life, a life that's worth living. And um, here, we, here we see here that, uh, you know, that's what God wants to do for us. And that's what Jesus wants to do for us. But there are conditions to an abundant life. And uh, Jesus says there's a way to get that abundant life. And uh, we'll go to John 3 now and uh, just a couple of verses here. And uh, once we know all too well. But Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. So you do need a born again experience. And, um, you know, we did speak to another young man yesterday and he was going to come today. He wanted to get baptised, but um, he's not here today. But uh, but anyway, he may, it'll be rolling around in his head. And, uh, you know, he, he told me just, just the day before he was spoken to by somebody that said, you need to get baptised. And the next day he's with us at the sausage sizzle hearing the same thing. You need to get baptised and fill with the Spirit. And, and I just said, I think God's calling you. And he says, you're absolutely right. God's calling me. He knew what was happening, what was going on. But... Um, sadly he's not here but maybe he'll follow up and uh, make it here still a, I think he wanted to get baptised but um, yeah, not quite ready yet but you know and some people we do have good intentions but you've got to follow through and do what Jesus said you know sometimes we can read these verses but people don't understand how to get born again or the process to it um, you know but we've got to be born again if we really want to live a life worth living that's abundant and um, that's the process that we need to follow you see jesus um we all going to die anyway you know sin came into the world through adam and eve's transgression and we were and death came ab about because of sin and, and so we all die and um so we have that life so every day we're alive we're we're one day closer to death really uh but um if we want to live a full life and a one that's 
abundant life, then we have to just follow the process, you know, be born again. Thy kingdom come here on earth as it in, is in heaven was one, was uh, a prayer that Jesus told people to say, well, it's here on earth already uh, through us, through the things of the Spirit and being born again of the Spirit. Now, we have access to God, for he is a spirit. Um, and uh, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth, as the word of God says. So we have all these scriptures, these other scriptures in play uh, that tells us that we need to be born again because this, this life that we have in the flesh is not going to last that long and it's really not the one that Jesus is talking about, the one that's worth living, the one that's abundant. And, uh, and, and even though Jesus promises a great life in this life, in the flesh, if you follow him anyway. Uh, but we know this one won't last, but it goes far beyond. It goes into the eternities in a body in the spirit. This is the, the born again body, the spiritual body, the one that will go forever, because this one won't. This body of flesh will not make it. But we need this new body uh, that will go forever, and that will be absolute abundant life with the Lord. Um, there's an Old Testament analogy of walking and talking with God, because that's where we're going to get to at the end of the day. See, they were walking and talking with God in the garden. You know, Adam and Eve were doing that, but the process of sin pushed them out, and, uh, and uh, death came about from sin. It was going to die, even though he lived to about 950 years of age. He still died one day, and he worked by the sweat of his brow to get there, and, uh, which is pretty much the process. But now all we get is our 70 years plus, uh, which is very sad. I mean, if you had 900 years, imagine the things you could do if you had 900 years of life. You know, you could you could build that house and have a 30-room house, whatever, by the time you're 300 at least, maybe. Who knows? Not that you need 30 rooms. Too much to clean and do and fix. But, um, you know, uh, you know, and he had, this, he had this life, so he got a good run at it, but he still died in the end. And... Um, and then the lifespan just kept coming down and down and down. Right, we'll go to Genesis 6 and we'll just have a look. Uh, way back here, there's an analogy of walking and talking with God. And it's uh, Noah, of course. Genesis 6. And verse 8. Uh, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. See, in the Spirit, we're now walking with God. We're now walking in the Spirit. The Bible talks about these terminologies where we walk in the Spirit, and we no longer walk in the flesh. So when we're walking in the Spirit, we are walking with God, and we can actually talk to God because he actually gives us a language to speak to him. So we actually can walk and talk with God through the Spirit. And the same process, it, it hasn't changed much. But it's still the same process. But here we see Noah here is, uh, is he walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Well, it sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? The story <laughs> sounds pretty familiar to today's world we live in. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. The rooms uh, shalt thou make in the ark, and thou shalt pitch it within and without uh, with pitch. And this is the fashion, or the pattern, uh, which thou shalt make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth 50 cubits, and the height 30 cubits, and the rest of the detail goes on, on how to build a ship, a big ship that's going to float. And, um, and, of course, God gave him good measurements, and, uh, and the pattern had to be followed. If he didn't follow the pattern to build the ark, it probably would have sunk. <laughs> I'm guessing it would have could have rolled over and just gone down. That would have been it. But God gave him the pattern. He gave him, this is the way, he gave him the set of plans. This is how you build the ark, and this is how the process works. And, um, and uh, when the world uh, went down, and of course, you know, they all thought he was crazy, um, you know, because he hadn't rained upon the earth, the Bible said, so they weren't expecting rain and they weren't expecting a flood i'm sure of it um but that's what he said was coming and you know we have the same message today really we you know the earth is going to be destroyed by fire next time around and and god will use the earth again probably to do that that's how he seems to operate the earth gets used and and um you don't have to be very intelligent to realize that the ring of fire 
circles the earth and if that tears apart there will be massive worldwide destruction and a lot of fire and uh, that's just sitting there doing its thing in the earth now and and uh, the volcanoes are erupting all over the place so iceland's going berserk i don't know if you watch the live feeds on youtube very interesting lava is very pretty and colorful on youtube watching it flow out of the ground all the tourists up there standing from here to those front row of chairs away from a lava flow i wouldn't be there because it could be from underneath you for all you know you know and uh but anyway you'd be cooked real quick but this is and and uh, hawaii went off and other places it's just it's getting very active you know we're, we're building up to this time where we're coming to another end and another reset for the world and the lord's return you know um, the bible specifically talks about the next destruction or the next reset of the corruption of the earth and ending that corruption and ending the violence that god saw in genesis 6 which is coming upon us soon will be by fire and uh, and god will end it and, and reset everything and of course that'll be the return of christ and we'll go on into the millennium and we won't have to deal with this type of world again you know jesus said it'll be like it was in the times of noah before i return just before i return it'll be like it was in noah's day so we get we get all the clues we get all the hints but it's not by water next time it'll be by fire so but there was a fashion there was a pattern to it you know and the bible talks about the holy ghost and fire experience john mentions it he said you know jesus will give you that one you'll get that holy ghost and fire experience from him and you must be born again to uh to get through to the other side that's our ark that's our salvation that's the one that will get us through the fire that's coming um acts 7 44 it says our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he had appointed speaking unto moses that he should make it according to the fashion or the same word pattern that he had seen so you know they just didn't build a tabernacle in the desert willy-nilly they just didn't throw up a few poles and uh, you know some canvases put together and skins sewed together and said oh this will work as a good tent we'll we'll keep the candlestick in here and the ark can live in here too that's a good spot they you know god gave them instructions god gave them he said this is how you make my tabernacle this is how you put the tent together there's got to be so many poles there's got to be so many rings there's got to be two lots of curtains it's made of badger skin it's got to be this color that color god had all the instructions on how to make the tabernacle exactly right and you can imagine if maybe if, if the tabernacle wasn't made right maybe man just decided oh oh we can cut a corner here we don't need to do do that room we can skip a room here or you know we don't need that many poles or whatever they could do whatever they want i suppose but they stuck to the pattern and you know maybe if they didn't stick to the pattern god wouldn't honor the sacrifice once a year that the high priest went in made atonement for the sins for the whole nation and maybe that wasn't going to wouldn't get honored if the tabernacle wasn't built to the pattern to the formula uh, but we know when you stick to god's formula to the pattern stuff works in first corinthians 6 19 paul the apostle now that we're filled with the holy ghost refers to us as the tabernacle he says what know you not that your body is the temple of the holy ghost which is in you uh, which ye have heard of god and ye are not your own so we were fashioned by the pattern by the process of being born again by getting filled with the holy ghost that was the pattern that was the way to our salvation that was our way through hebrews 8 2 one verse here says another thing a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the lord pitched and not man see man doesn't pitch the tabernacle god pitched the tabernacle god pitched you and i when he filled you with the holy spirit it was god's choice to give us the holy spirit when we humbled ourselves to a point where we were accessible to it and um, and god did that god pitches the tabernacle god puts the tabernacle up we don't get to decide how it gets done uh, we just need to follow the process and uh and to be a part of everything you know god has for us you know uh, you know living our life living a good life you know uh, we've got the opportunity to make something of this life that we have with the lord particularly now that you're spirit filled and if you understand bible prophecy and read your bible and do a little bit of research here and there you've got stuff to say you've got great stuff to tell people that is simply lost out there in the world that have no idea what's going on in fact some people are just freaking out about you know all the diseases kind of what's happening in the world and the war in the ukraine and you know recession and what's people got no idea they're so worried about the world situation um 
but we've got our Bibles and God talks about this stuff all you know through through our Bibles and um, we know what's coming we know what's happening you know we don't just exist with the Holy Ghost in us God wants us to do a little bit more than just exist with the Holy Spirit in us he wants us to go out and live it live our life in the Spirit and be that that good testimony you know I was talking to uh, uh, my brother Gary the other day he was chatting to a, a guy that he said he was in a bus going to an airport and this guy heard Gary talking and uh, he turns around and he goes, that's got to be a Josky. And Gary goes, yeah. And he goes, Gary Josky? And he says, yeah. And he says, oh, I'm such and such. Anyway, he, Gary didn't recognize him, but he knew him from how many years ago? 30? Yeah. 35 years ago. And he just recognized his wife. That's when he last saw him. And his first question was, are you still in that church? First question, are you still in that church? People know, people remember. We're a living testimony. We have a life to live in the spirit. One that's really worthy to live. One that God has pitched. He's pitched your tabernacle. God put it up for you to be an example to, to people. I got a phone call from a fellow I worked with when I was 21, um, about a year ago. So what was the gap? 40 years or something, gap. And this guy rings me. I remember him because he had a strange, we used to pay out on him. His name was Ken Yorn. And he used to go, yeah, Yorn. Yeah, yeah, anyway, we used to muck around. And he goes, this is Kenny Yorn. I'm going, Ken Yorn. I said, there's a name from the past. You know why he rang me up? I don't know how he tracked me down. But he rang me up to tell me he'd been filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. He goes, you still going to that church? You still praying in tongues? I said, yep, absolutely. I said, and he goes, oh, he said, I, he remembered. All those years ago, he knew we were, we were spirit-filled. And that I used to go to the smoko room with brochures and pamphlets and stuff. The Anointed of the Lord. I used to have that little booklet, The Anointed of the Lord. Learned a real lot out of that when I was back in my, when I, in my late teens. It was a really good little booklet. And I learned a lot of scripture from that. And I used to read that during smoko. And I, I, hardly anyone else in the room was spirit-filled. There was a couple others. But um, there was a crowd in there. There was a lot of guys who worked at this place. And I used to just share what I was reading. And go, oh, wow, look at that. And I'd share it, <laughs> and uh, whether they wanted to hear it or not. But they knew that we were different and we went to church and we were spirit-filled. They knew all about speaking in tongues. And, and Ken heard it all, but he was 40 years later. He got baptized spirit-filled and he wanted to ring me and tell me. So, so people remember. People remember that you're a living testimony for the Lord. Uh, and God wants us to make something of our lives. Noah just didn't simply exist in his day either. Noah got out and about and started building an ark. He didn't just exist, he started being an example for the Lord. He went, Why are you building an ark? Well, it's going to rain. I know it hasn't yet, but it's going to rain and it's going to flood and you're all going to drown and you know, get some tickets to get in the ark. Um, sadly, no one believed him and uh, they, they, only him and his family went in and were saved. That was it. You know, and, it, and it's and it is a pretty unbelievable story, you know. I mean, we could go and talk to people and that Jesus Christ is coming back and it's going to be a thousand years of millennium and the world's going to, there's going to be a lot of fire and a lot of burning and there's a lot of this and a lot of that. And, and uh, people probably don't believe you and they don't have to believe you, but it's still the truth. It's still what's going to happen in the future. God said it, it will happen. And um, so we see these things happening and Noah didn't just exist. He made an example, he did stuff, and he lived for the Lord, and he was there, you know. Uh, I'll just read a couple of verses in Genesis 5, verse 22. You know, if we're walking with God at Jesus' return, then he will take you. He will change our body in a, in a moment, and we'll rise to meet the Lord in the air in the spirit uh, or in the clouds, it says, but the clouds is a, is a wonderful analogy for the spirit. So we, we might just be in the spirit with the Lord in our new body and the old one will be gone. Whatever, the, whatever will, that will look like, we don't know. But we know Jesus had a new body after his resurrection and they saw him, they could see him, they could touch him. So, so it's obviously a, a physical thing as well in some description, but uh, not corruptible, not subject to age or anything like that. So we know that was happening. So... There's a fellow way back in Genesis 5, Enoch. It says uh, in verse 22 of Genesis 20, sorry, verse 22 of Genesis 5, it says, Enoch walked with God after he get, begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. 
um, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So God decided that that he would, you know, Enoch was there walking with God, uh, talking with God, and God thought, I'll, I'll take you now. Uh, wherever he took him to, is anybody's guess? I mean, Methuselah lived to 969 years of age, um, so he had another 500 and something years of life left in him, so whatever God took him for, who knows, but um, he took him, but Hebrews 11 tells us a bit more, in verse 5, Hebrews 11, 5, it says, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him, for he had, for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God, and really at the end of the day, that's what we need to do, we need to please God, not ourselves, but please God and do what God would have us to do and do his things and be about his business. You know, if we're going to exist, um, uh, then let's believe that God uh, uh, can give us the life, you know, according to his will that we're, we're looking for, the life that we want. Um, um, I'll take you to 1 Peter in chapter 4 and verse 2. One Peter, chapter four, verse two. All right, guys, I'm not sure if you're getting the scriptures on screen. I forgot to give you my notes, talk notes. Kathy, never mind. It's pretty fast on the keyboard. First Peter, chapter four, verse two. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself likewise with the same mind, for for he hath suffered in the flesh. Uh, for he that hath suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. So living our life to the will of God, walking and talking with God is our aim now. That's what we do now. We walk with the Lord in the Spirit and we talk with the Lord in the Spirit, in tongues. It's a correct communication. God understands every word we're saying. In fact, the Spirit speaks for us on our behalf because we don't even get the words right sometimes, I'm sure, particularly if we putting them into English, and um, but the Spirit knows us better than probably we know us. It knows our heart, it knows our situation, it knows everything. So when we're praying in tongues to the Lord, we, we're doing that walking and talking with God and we're getting the very best information through to the Lord uh, on our behalf. For, in verse 3, for the time past of our life uh, may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles um, when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. So, you know, they just, they just in times past, even though, you know, he's referring to what they would have called themselves, uh, you know, the, the children of God or children of Israelites, you know, and they thought God was only on their side. Of course, that all changed with uh, the Holy Spirit, and, uh, and that was just open then for everybody to come along but, you know, and they thought they didn't live the life of the Gentiles, but many of them did. And that was the problem. They were still in sin, living the same life as just everybody else in the world and uh, doing the wrong thing. And he, and he lists, you know, what they're doing, excessive wines, the lust, revelings, banquetings. People just eat, drink and be merry, like the word says. That's what they were doing. Just eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. So they were living their life to the full, but the, the very short life that they've got and uh and you know and not many years after that comes their health problems that come with all of that as well verse four wherein they think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of right speaking evil of you yeah so people are generally unhappy when we pro pro profess a testimony and um you know show the lord people want us to do what they're doing and uh and uh because they don't like it if you're not doing what they're doing but we hold our testimony we hold our ground Wherein they think, uh, speaking of verse 5, who shall give account uh, to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according uh, to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Uh, but the end of all things is at hand, uh, be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. So uh, Peter's instruction here, the end of all things is coming. And it's been the catch catchphrase throughout the New Testament. Jesus is coming back. The Lord is coming back. And, uh, you know, maybe they were hoping it was going to be in their lifetime, but it's been a few thousand years since then. And we're getting right to the very end 
of everything. Even the time clocks are running out of time. You know, we're 6,000 years since Adam, and if you're following, you know, the Bible pattern of things and the way God does, he does things in sixes and sevens. The seventh created the world in six days. So, man, the seventh day he rested. The day of rest will come the millennium, the 7,000th year, and we're almost there. You know, and uh, our calendars could be out by a year or two or months or who knows. You know, we've switched calendars so many times backwards and forwards, but it doesn't matter. We're nearly there. We know we've got 2,000 years since BC. We've got those dates. And then you've got all the, we've got the, well, Pastor Tim talked about the Hebrew calendar and the Jewish cal- the calendar, the Islamic calendar. We've got all those calendars as well that we can date things, but you know, they didn't have leap years. They didn't allow for certain things. And sometimes they reset the calendars and go, oh, Hang on a second, it's two in the afternoon and it's pitch black, something's wrong, it's middle of summer. And uh, so they just would change the time clocks and go, something's wrong here. And so they figured out the leap year issue and that fixed that problem, of course. And uh, they didn't have to worry about it. But we're so close to the 7,000 years. And if we're following the pattern, the day of rest is coming for the church, for the saints of God, those that are spirit filled. The day of rest of coming is coming for this body of flesh that's just not going to make it. But the body and the spirit will live forever and it'll be a rest forever entering into the Lord's rest as the Bible tells us uh, and it'll be a wonderful time the end of all things but we live and this is why the gospel was preached so we could live the life worth living the one that will go forever the one that's beyond this life and um, this is why the gospel was preached and we, so we could live according to God uh, in the spirit not in the flesh not in the way we think We serve God. Many people serve God the way they think. You know, I love God. He'll love me. I'll make it to heaven on the day. Well, that's all very nice, but you need confirmation of that, don't you? You need that confirmation, you know, and um, real confirmation is when you receive the Holy Ghost because you speak out in tongues and no one has to tell you. You know, we don't tell people, oh, you found the Lord, you're filled with the Holy Spirit the moment they speak in tongues. They know straight away. You know, I have question marks beforehand, but after you've received the Spirit, you generally know. Nobody needs to tell you. And, um, and because the Spirit communicates with you and it tells you straight away. Now, I was only 10 years old when I received the Holy Spirit. And somebody said, and I wanted to receive the Holy Spirit. And they said, I'll read Acts chapter 2. That'll help you get over the line. And I read Acts chapter 2. Didn't have a clue what it all meant. Didn't have a clue. Uh, but four weeks later, I received the Holy Spirit. And I read Acts chapter 2, and it was fantastic. It was like, oh, wow, yeah, so it happened to me there, yeah. It all made sense. I was only 10, but made sense because the Spirit connected with the Scripture because it's a spiritual book. And you, and people read this, got to read the spiritual stuff in it. It's an inspirited word, and spiritual eyes dec- decode it properly. And um, otherwise, you're just reading ink on paper, and you're still reading the parables. Without the Holy Spirit, you're still reading parables. That's why Jesus spoke in parables, so that people could join the dots later. When they received the Holy Spirit, you can decipher a parable. He was, Jesus was good enough to explain a couple to his disciples before they'd received the Holy Spirit. The sower and the seed was one of them. And he explained the parable. He go, what on earth is all that about? You know, a seed fell on the ground and a bird took it. And, da, da, da. and then he could tell us what it means, you know. But Jesus did. He said, I'll tell you what it means, the parable of the sower and the seed. But many parables, he, he just spoke them and it was just a story, and it's a nice story, and um, and that's it. That's all it is for so many people. They don't get to the spiritual, what's underneath the black ink on the page, and uh, all the spiritual stuff that comes with our Bible. Spirit-filled eyes read a spirit-filled uh, read the inspirited word of God. The end of all things is coming. First Corinthians seven thirty-one, one verse, and do they use this world as not abusing it for the fashion of this world passes away there's that word fashion again keeps popping up in the bible but the way the world does things the fashion the pattern of the world will will end it's going to pass away so whatever this world's got going i'm sorry but your superannuation is gone already it's the fashion of that's gone everything's gone we enter in a new age and probably won't even need money uh, to, to live the abundant life that god has on offer you know, the fashion of this world will end. But, but if you fashion yourself to the things that God tells you to do, like Noah, 
build an ark. This is the pattern. This is the fashion of the ark. This is the way you do it. This is the way you build the tabernacle. This is the fashion. This is the way it is. This is the way the gospel is preached. This is the pattern. This is the fashion of getting saved. You've got to be born again. You've got to receive the Holy Spirit. You need to be baptized. You need to do all of these things. Repentance gets you over the line for all of it. But that's the fat. That's the pattern. That's the fashion of it. That's the way it works. What the world's got going will end and pass away. Only what God's got going is the one that will last into the eternities. Um, I've got a little quote here. I don't know who, who said it. Uh, it's just an internet quote, but um, uh, I don't think they had received the Holy Spirit, but they were obviously God conscious. And the quote goes like this. It says, I would rather live my life as if there is a God and die to find out there isn't. I thought it was pretty clever. And then he says, then, my, uh, then live my life as if there isn't a God and die to find out there is. I thought well, that's pretty smart. This is someone that's hedging their bets, no doubt, either way. But they're saying, you know, and uh, you probably wouldn't make that quote if you feel the Holy Spirit. But this was obviously somebody that was thinking about God and probably served God to the best of their ability. And maybe they got spirit filled later. God will find a way to... Uh, give all people the full gospel message but this person i'd rather live my life as if there is a god and die to find out there isn't and because that's a better process uh, than live my life as if there isn't a god which so many people in the world do they just discount god completely and um and they're going to die and they're going to find out there is a god <laughs> and that's going to be the sad reality of it they will find out that there is a god that had a process in place to save everyone on the planet but if you don't want to get in board the ark, you know, the pattern's already been set. as It's already been laid down how it works because no one got on the ark. <laughs> the door was open. And who shut the door? God. God shut the door. No, he didn't shut it. He kept it open as long as he could to save whoever, you know, Joe Bloggs down the road or Farmer Fred that he used to get his silver beat from or whatever, you know, kept the door open for him to come. You know, it's going to rain. You're all going to die. Nobody believed him, obviously. I think they believed when the rain fell, but it's too late then, isn't it? When it's obvious, it's too late. There's no faith anymore. No, it's not faith-based anymore. And when it's not faith-based, it's, it's, it's not going to work for you. Too late to, to uh, you know, get things right uh, with the Lord. That's the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. You know, the foolish ones didn't do much. They really didn't live the life that God wanted them to live in the spirit. So their oil had run out, or didn't have much at all. And then they saw the Lord coming. Midnight came, they saw God coming. And they went looking to top up their oil, but it was too late. There wasn't enough time to get it together for those foolish virgins. And they simply weren't living the life God was expecting them to live um, after the fashion of he, that he'd put in place for them. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Oh, gee, it's getting late. Where'd all that time go? Um, going to have to finish. In Deuteronomy 30, I'll just, I'll just have to paraphrase it because I don't have time to read it. Um, they, they, you know, they, um, this was the uh, covenant that uh, Moses spoke to the children of Israel in the land of Moab. And he basically said, he was just telling them, keep the Lord's commandments. You know, it's, it's, you can, it's not hard to do. It's not a far off. You don't have to cross some sea or go to heaven to get close to God. He's saying all these things in Deuteronomy 30. And he says, it's not very far, but it's right here. It's right here in your mouth and in your heart. Moses is saying, you want to serve God, you do it right here with your mouth, with your heart. And, uh, and he said, this day, he says, I put before you... Um, and, he, and he, wanted, he wanted them to walk in his commandments and his statutes. In verse 16 of Deuteronomy 30, I'll just read out a verse. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. You know, to live and to really live to the fullest of your... Of your this is what God wanted for his people. Um, and, uh, and he says, and the Lord will bless thee in the land where you go to possess it. And... They, they did it for a while, they had blessing for a while, but then they cottoned on to 
what the other people were doing in the land and they started serving their gods and they ditched the God that they were supposed to serve and God was angry with that. God was jealous with that. God wasn't happy with any of that and things just went bad for them in the end. And uh, that's the story of the children of Israel if you want to read it through the, through the Old Testament. They just weren't, they had the opportunity to live the life they wanted to the fullest and and uh, but uh, they blew it you know it was good for a while but they just it didn't work for them in the end you know and, and I think it tells you in there it says but if thine heart turn away so that they will not hear but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them I denounce you this day that you shall surely perish and that uh, you shall not prolong your days upon the land so God was warning them you know is you, you won't get the life you want if you don't do things my way if you don't do things according to my way. God gives great advice, always gives great advice. And um, he expected them to do things your way, but they, they didn't. And um, in verse 19, it says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that uh, both thou and thy seed may live forever. So it was about choosing the life they wanted to live. They had the opportunity. It's not like God was, you know, saying, oh, you're all evil. I'm going to destroy you. I mean, that happened here and there, but they had always had the opportunity to choose the best life they could possibly have. And it's no different today. In We have the opportunity to choose the best life we have today. We're in, we can pray in the Spirit. We've got the Holy Spirit. We've got the Word of God. We've got a fellowship we can go to. We've got everything at our, at our fingertips to live the life we want to live, the abundant life, even in the flesh, before the real abundant life comes of eternity with the Lord. Okay, there's a whole story there about Hezekiah, but we're going to skip that. And we'll go John, John 11 to verse 25. <clears throat> if you want to read it, Isaiah 38, it's about Hezekiah and how God gave him an extra 15 years of life and what his prayer was, which was a really good prayer that he gave to the Lord for thanking the Lord for uh, giving him 15 years of extra life. Anyway, a great example here in John 11, verse 25. Jesus said unto her, this is Martha. This was Lazarus' sister. He, and uh, this was Jesus talking directly out. And uh, he just is he, raising Lazarus from the dead here. He'd been dead three days. Jesus was making a point, all right? Even though it's a notable miracle. The point he was making, it doesn't matter if you die, you're going to come back to an abundant life. You're coming back to a life. This was the example. And this is why I think Jesus said this to Martha, which was Lazarus' sister. I am, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, um, yet shall he live. Don't even matter if you're dead and you die in the spirit, you will live. You will get the abundant life that God has promised, that Jesus promised. The first scripture we read out, Jesus has promised the abundant life, the son of God. He's promised it to you. Um, you know, uh, uh, Pastor Lloyd used to say, uh, you know, you're dead already without the Holy Spirit. You're dead already, even though you may be alive. <laughs> but you've got to do things God's way. You have to do things God's way. Yet shall he live. And whosoever, verse 26, John 11, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. So Jesus was just making statements that will be true and correct in the very not too distant future. Believest thou this? He says unto Martha, she saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come in to the world. And the question is still the same. Do we believe it? Do you believe it? Do I believe it? We have to believe it. God said so. It will happen. It will come to pass. The abundant life is just is there for us all to have. And uh, Jesus Christ is coming back. You know, uh, Martha, Martha believed it and uh, because... God, Jesus made the point so she could believe it and raised her brother from the dead after he was three days in the grave. So Jesus really made the point about what life is going to be like after this one. And Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And finishing in Galatians 2 verse 20, it says, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Yes, we kill off our old life. We do that because the old life is full of 
things that God doesn't want us to be a part of and to be doing. We hear heard that in testimony, how the, the drugs went and the smoking went and the swearing went. The things of this world pass away. We move on to a different life that we live in the spirit and we live by that and, uh, and we kill that off. And, but nevertheless, we still live and we have a wonderful, abundant life, even in the flesh and living our life for the Lord. We have a better life in the flesh. And even if we die and the flesh goes, the life is still there in the spirit and it will be abundant and it will be forever. You know, God doesn't want us to just exist, but he wants us to start living life to the fullest in the spirit. And, uh, and we do all that by the faith of the Son of God. Amen. Leave it there.